welcome back to another vintage radio repair. Uh, this time we're having a look at a Bell Colt. Now Bell Colts are the quintessential Kiwi radio. They were made for nearly 30 years in various different trims, many many different dials, different knobs. These I'm pretty sure somebody has put on aftermarket and I'll be replacing those with proper proper knobs. Uh, this is the brown tortoiseshell cabinet, but they came out, like I said, multiple different colours. Uh, this is probably the second most common coloured cabinet behind cream or white. Circuitry changes over the 30 years, there were quite a few. This one's a 5B5, and the 5B5 was a third different circuit design. There was the original one, which ran from 51 to 53. There was a 5B4 chassis style which ran in 1954, a 5B5 which is this one from 1955 and then onwards multiple different changes through the years but we're going to take a look at this one. They're not all that different between um, here and sort of the mid 60s. The circuitry didn't change all that much uh, even though the layout of the chassis and the valve lineup did. So if you've seen one you've seen them all kind of thing. It, it's not quite that simple but um, for now this is the one we're going to have a look at and if you have one hopefully this will be helpful to you. What I'm going to do is just get this working. We'll actually fire it up on the dim bulb tester to start with and, and see if it works which is always good practice. Don't just plug it into anything. Plug into a dim bulb tester to protect it just in case. Uh, make sure it's working before you start or at least that you know what the potential issues that you're going to face are. So first thing, give it a visual inspection, make sure that we're not going to plug it in and make a big loud bang. Uh, the plug is an interesting one. Uh, first glance it looks okay. Uh, certainly don't be afraid to take the plug off and just check that you don't have frayed or disconnected wires in there. Uh, the cord looks fine along its length and is most likely original. Uh, you want to check all the valves are there. Now in these earlier ones the rectifier valve lives behind here and you can't easily see it so I'm just going to check it's there. Yep it is and it's seated correctly. And everything looks fine. We have a look at the speaker code down the back there. 18C5. So C is ABC January, February, March and 55. So Speakers from March 55. It is a 5B5, or in this case, this one is stamped with just B5. Uh, there is the odd one you find like that. Uh, sometimes there'll be a date or a date code on the electrolytic. I can't see it from here if there is, uh, but fairly safe bet that this is from 1955. Okay, so to get it out of the cabinet, we need to take off the knobs. Now, from about 1959-1960 onwards, Bell Colts used a push-on knob, which was, uh, you know, a nice update. But as anyone who's worked with Bell Colts will tell you, those knobs today are an absolute nightmare. They tend to weld themselves to the shaft. Uh, I don't know whether it's just the type of plastic and the strength of the spring around that plastic sleeve that pushes onto the shaft, but they, uh, they tend to be a case of break them off to get them off and that means from 1960 onwards it's actually reasonably difficult to find good knobs uh, and often what you find is broken knobs that have been glued on and it's really about the only solution without uh, remodeling and, and remolding knobs is to actually uh, break them off and then just refit them with a wee bit of uh, like a, a dab of contact adhesive or something just enough to hold them on but enough that you can actually take them off again later if you need to. Now this one is just really tightly on the tuning shaft. There we go. Not a good fit. Those knobs are awful and they don't belong there. So, like I say, I'm fortunate enough to have some brown domed knobs, so I'll be fitting those when we're done. Those will not be going back on. So, knobs off. 
and then we've got two screws on the bottom here. Uh, these should not be over tightened or they will crack the case around here. Uh, I tend to just hold the, the chassis down. Stop it rocking up. It won't rock too far, but this one is actually rusted in. Fabulous! Now the chassis is aluminium, so it won't be rusted to the aluminium, but it's rusted into the aluminium. And it's not going to come out easily. This is uh, the first screwdriver I grabbed, not my good one. Use a decent screwdriver. And be careful. Flat blade screws uh, don't capture the end of the blade very well. And I have, I have scars to prove that uh, <laughs> bad things can happen. just awful. Fortunately I have some uh, of the correct size screws so we'll be replacing that one. Won't be putting that back in. It actually looks like it's got some aluminium oxide in the threads there so it has started to corrode the aluminium as well. Not cutie cutie. Okay, so everything should slide out as one, and it does, and it's worth having a look in here and make sure that peg is still intact, and that's what actually locates the, the cabinet in position. Uh, sometimes you find those broken off, at which point there's nothing really locating the front of the chassis, except the, the knobs and the holes, so they can flap up and down a little bit, which puts uh, stress on these points here. So we're going to wash that later and give it a clean up. There is some nice um, tortoiseshell swirl under there. So we'll try and revive that a little bit. But that's not the job for now. Let's just have a quick visual inspection here. So we've got what appears to be an aerial wire. Um, that looks like a replacement. I've never seen one with a wire that heavy before, or that I recall anyway. Um, aerial wire is normally a thin green one on these, which is what we've got here. And inside top of these cabinets would typically have a piece of cardboard with foil on it as an aerial, and this is the connection to that aerial. So the, that's why there's three wires here. One of them is the aerial wire, one is the wire that connects to this for the internal aerial, and the other one's the earth. So five valves, as I said, rectifiers here hidden behind the transformer, so uh, quite often people will look at these and go it's a four valve set. Um, later on this rectifier moved out in front where you could see it and get to it easily. This one, I'm not sure about this speaker. We've actually got an output transformer mounted on the chassis here, which is not where they normally were. So this may be a replacement. And the speaker may also be, potentially be a replacement. Normally the output transformer is mounted on a bracket on the back of the, the speaker. So I'll do a wee bit more investigation into that. I don't know that the Roller Model 5B speaker uh, was an original fit here. Now having said that, uh, people talk about what the original knobs were for these as well. And the reality is that the dome-shaped knobs were probably the one that most people remember. The gold ring knobs are probably the second most common, but there are others. And given the numbers that these are produced in, there's bound to be situations of knob shortages or just using whatever knobs they could get. And um, I know from talking to people who worked at Bell who have spoken to older people who worked at Bell, uh, anecdotal evidence actually backs that up. They, they had the knobs they preferred, but there was also the knobs they could get. This could also be a case of that. This might be the speaker they could get. Uh, the output transformer may be original or it may have been added later. Hard to tell at this point. There may be some evidence underneath that will give it away. So let's get to that. This is a pretty standard 
bell cult underneath. Doesn't look like it's had any work done to it. The two power supply resistors here, uh, 1k wire wound, and then a, normally what is about a 2k2 or a 2k7. This looks like a 2k4, although it just looks like a yellow band there, so who knows? We'll measure those. You always want to check these two resistors and make sure they're in, in spec. This one being wire wound. Um, wire wound resistors very seldom drift. They are the resistance they are right up until the point where they are open circuit. Uh, they're generally pretty reliable. But these carbon resistors, not quite so reliable. So we'll check that. These are subject to a bit of heat and current. And so they can go out. Um, having said that, all these other resistors, potentially same deal. Um, this is an inkling that some work might have been done. This looks like a mustard cap. I'm not aware of mustard caps having been used in the original circuitry. And um, this looks like it could be a Hunts cap. So we'll have a look. Um, again, made in such large numbers that it's hard to say what was original and what wasn't. Um, you know, the, the chances are that just because it doesn't look like another bell colt of the same model, uh, it could just be a supply and um, you know, production changes to suit what they could get. So typically in these sets, you'll see a paper cap down here, and you'll see a paper cap here. So these two will need to be changed. And by and large, in most sets from about this point onwards in the production cycle, all the other caps will be uh, probably disc ceramic, and those are pretty stable and generally don't need replacing. This one is prior to that, so we've got paper caps right throughout the set. Um, so we'll be replacing all of those, and most importantly, this here is the power supply smoothing cap or the electrolytic can that's going to be replaced and we'll do that with a bit of tag strip and a couple of capacitors just to tidy things up the, the other way to do it is to gut the inside of that can and put the new capacitors inside it but um, i've done that before uh, on the pacemaker petite i had to do it there because there just was no space to do anything else here i've got a bit of room under underneath and by moving these two resistors, I can have a wee bit more room to put a tag strip here reasonably neatly and just attach it directly to um, uh, to the wires that already exist, with one exception that I can see here, which is this black wire uh, here that runs to the last part of the electrolyte can. That, uh, if I put the tag strip where I'm hoping to, which is here, won't be long enough, so I'll have to replace that wire, but everything else should just reach to the new tag strip uh, without too many troubles. Okay, enough waffle. Let's see if we can power it up first. Okay, so we're plugged into the dim bulb tester. That's turned off and it's switched to go via the bulb. The radio's turned off, so I should be able to turn this on and nothing will happen. Uh, if something happens, I'll know that the on-off switch is broken in the set. Uh, but nothing did. So at this point, we can turn the radio on. We should see uh, some light flare up and then die down again as the initial surge uh, comes through the system. Then uh, the heaters will start to heat up in the valves, and as they start to emit electrons and, and the valves start to operate, we'll see the bulb brightness just start to come up again. And that's what we expect. If it gets really bright and stays bright, we know that there's a short circuit or some kind of problem in the set. And the set's acting like a short circuit, meaning all the voltage is supplied to the bulb. Uh, and the bulb is operating the way you'd normally expect a light bulb to operate. That means bad things here. So uh, if this at any point is really bright and stays that way for more than about a second, you should be worried. You should switch the set off and go looking for the culprit. Okay. Turning on, so you see a wee flare up of the filament, 
that blink then is not normal and that could be uh, problems in the electrolytic capacitor. Uh, it could have been just some um, corrosion in one of the contacts that got burnt off. Uh, it could be a number of things but uh, this is doing what I would expect it to do. And we've got some sound. All right, so we've got. The SBCA says COVID restrictions and a summer breathing surge has meant an influx of strays. All right, so this is working as I would expect. We haven't got any significant flare up here, and there's no hum. Now, any hum that you hear from the speaker indicates that this power supply electrolytic here is in distress, uh, seriously damaged and needs to be replaced. Now, having said that, no hum does not mean we don't need to replace that, because 1955 to now is a long time, well past its service life or its expected service life. So we're going to recap it, uh, because... As a radio, it needs to be safe, uh, and it needs to work. And whilst it might be working here, the one thing that you can pretty much guarantee is that if I just go, oh yeah, it works, it's fine, kick it out the door, it will not be working in a month's time. Back to old trusty, um, this is a Dick Smith Electronics uh, multimeter that I bought way back in the day when I was working there. Actually, it wasn't when I was working there, I just joined the Air Force and I uh, it was one of my first pay packets. Uh, I came back and bought myself this and an analog one uh, for doing audio. My good old Hung Chang, which is a wee bit dusty and a wee bit dirty, but that's served me well for many, many years. As has this one. Uh, it was pretty flash in the day. It's got somewhere on it. It's got these these holes here, which is a serial output, you could actually have this feed live data to something. Never ever used it. I think I've now lost the cable for it, uh, but I carted that around for a long, long time. So, nostalgia, I'm quite fond of this meter. It ain't the flashiest thing in the world, but I'm not a fluke fanboy. I don't have to have a fancy meter, and I certainly couldn't justify a fancy meter for doing this. I may get one one day, but uh, as I said, 1K, that's reading almost perfectly 1K. So these wire wound resistors, they stay pretty stable for for a happy long time. Uh, it's 2.96, so probably near enough to spec of what I would expect to see in there, 2.5 to 2.7K. Uh, but we may replace that as a matter of course because it is starting to go high which these carbon resistors do so that's those and if we have a look at the the circuit and I'll throw the 5B5 circuit up on the screen here so you can see that the uh, three capacitors which are the three pins in here uh, the three capacitors are connected via resistors which form a, a filtering network and reduce the voltage down in stages as well. So um, this pin here is the final output one, the middle one is the middle cap, and this first one is the one that connects directly to the um, rectifier. So underneath here, that's just made a liar of me. Ah, I see why. Yeah, you see this wire here, well you might not see this wire here because it's buried under everything, but we've got a red wire which comes from the rectifier and goes to the red terminal. The red terminal is the first uh, 20 microfarad electrolytic. Uh, from that same terminal we've got this 1K resistor which goes across to this terminal here and then feeds down to the yellow, which is the second electrolytic or the 10 mic, uh, the middle one. 
and then the resistor from there goes to the third one, which is the unmarked one. Now in a lot of sets, particularly later ones, this red and yellow terminal will be transposed, so it'll go red on the left, yellow, and then no colour. If you're not sure, the can itself will be marked uh, with what those coloured terminals mean. So if we just take the valve out, you can see uh, red reservoir, 20 microfarads, yellow, 10 mic, blue, 10 mic. So blue is the unmarked one on the bottom. Um, this is a Hunts. I'm not going to go into people's opinions on Hunts. We all know what people think of Hunts capacitors. Um, Hunts, Ducon, whatever, they all need replacing. So that red one, that's our first one from the rectifier. As I say, that red wire connects it, and it's all a wee bit iggledy-piggledy just to make things fit. It's not laid out the way it is in the schematic. Radios very seldom are. But um, you can certainly trace it out in your mind or grab a bit of paper and a pencil and trace it out. So this we won't replace. This we might. Um, like I said, once I get these out of the way, I can actually put a bit of tag strip back here. And I'll need to be really careful because normally I would use a self-tapping screw uh, through a hole into here, but there is an output transformer screwed to the chassis that I don't want to put a hole in. So I'm just going to check, and yet we're fine. There is actually room underneath the speaker there, just behind this can, that I can drill a hole without jeopardizing anything. Okay, so this is the tag strip I use. I was fortunate enough to buy uh, a box full of bags full of these. Um, I paid a heck of a lot for it. And the, the reason I did it is it's just really hard to find. So uh, this is in good nick. It's not corroded, which a lot of the new old stock stuff you find uh, these terminals are quite grey and quite hard to solder to. This stuff is, is really good. I've been very happy with it. And it makes life really easy when you're doing replacements of this. If you're not actually fitting the capacitors inside the original old can, putting them on a bit of tag strip is just the best way to do it. Uh, or certainly the best way I've found to do it. So that tag strip is going to sit about there. and uh, Or it's going to sit around this way. Uh, probably that way, and then we'll uh, screw it down into the chassis. I won't trust that as an earth. I'm going to use this earth tag. Uh, I never trust a screwed terminal unless I'm actually putting a bolt with a star washer and cranking it down nice and tight. Uh, I just don't trust it. Even then, I tend to run a wire. So you can see in here we've got earth wires run around all the tags, so there's riveted tags on this aluminium chassis, but they still ran earth wires to all those tags to make sure that the connection was right. So we'll do the same here. Uh, so as you can see, if we put it this way, then I'll put the 20 mic capacitor positive on this tag and the two 10 mics on these two tags. So that wire there is the only one that connects to the red the 20 mic here, that will certainly reach this no problem. Uh, this is the middle 10 microfarad one, so we'll have to replace that because that won't reach. Uh, it's just a little run of copper wire, tin copper wire, which is easy enough to do. And then here we've got this one, which I pointed out before, and this resistor leg and this resistor leg. So this one's actually quite easy. Some of them have more wires onto here than that, uh, but certainly this will be our third one, it'll be on this tag here, so if that's there, then this will reach and this will reach, this I'll have to replace. So two wires to replace, and we're golden, we're good to go. So not all of them use this tag strip this way. In fact, uh, a lot of the later sets will use this tag strip to mount the power cord coming in. So you may find that this tag strip actually has mains on it on some sets, so just be aware of that. In that case, often this resistor will go from here right across to this first tag, and this one will come off the first tag and um, go to the second tag. So 
uh, sorry, that'll go to the middle tag because, and this wire will go to this tag. Um, figure it out as you go. I'm, I'm just going to end up confusing the issue. Uh, the, <laughs> the reality is they made them for a long time. There were production changes, there were design changes. Some of those changes were probably around the length of this resistor. Certainly some chassis uh, have big long bodied resistors that uh, will run from here to here quite happily. So uh, you've just got to work it out and be sure of what wires are what. Uh, but the one thing that most of them seem to have is from the rectifier valve uh, a red or a brown wire that runs across and goes to the electrolytic capacitor and the tag it goes to. That's your first filter capacitor. Um, in this case it's marked red and like I say in later ones it often goes to this terminal and this terminal is marked red. So just check where the wiring goes, check the side of the can of the electrolytic and look at the schematic. Um, if you get this wrong you're going to feed the wrong voltages to the wrong parts of the circuit and you're going to have a nightmare on your hands. So like I said my intention is it's going to sit there it can sit across a little bit, but I don't want it too close to this tag strip, so about there I think is where I'm going to put it. So we'll drill a wee hole in the chassis and mount this and wire it up. Um, now I'm just going to cut wires off here because I know where they go, and this is just purely an experience thing. I never recommend that people just cut everything off and then try and remember where it was. Take lots of photos, draw pictures if you need to. But for me, getting the stuff out of the way initially is going to help me just get in and see what I'm doing. I know where the stuff goes, so it's not going to cause me any grief long term. And um, yeah, your mileage may vary. Uh, certainly you want to cut the old capacitors out of circuit. Don't just put the new capacitors across those terminals and call it done because by doing that uh, you're not only increasing the capacitance if you put capacitors in parallel then you add the two values of the capacitances together and these are low value capacitance for a reason. Um, the other problem is that by putting them in parallel and leaving that in circuit you've got faulty capacitors which will shunt DC straight to ground putting more load and more stress on the power supply circuitry and possibly burning something out uh, which means your, your new capacitors aren't doing anything uh, which is not ideal because we're replacing them so um, yeah so these two go together somewhere this goes together somewhere and this does so it's clear that space out right watch these tags um, if I actually put it too close here then I've got the tags sitting on the bottom of this Bakelite strip which could touch um, they won't be in this particular instance so just just be aware you don't want to short things out inadvertently so about there's where my hole's going to go. So I'll grab a drill bit, stick a hole through there. Okay, so here's our 22 mic. Um, it's basically going to go on like that and I've got to fit three capacitors along here so get a couple of tens as well All right, so a couple of tens so I normally try and keep my capacitors facing up in a way that they can be seen and that's not always easy to do when you're using tag strip uh, I want the tag strip sitting in, sitting in a certain position and whilst I could put the capacitor this way so that you can read the value on it if I do that it's now sitting in the way of other things that I want to do there so you know rules are 
are really just guidelines. I mean, there are no real rules about how to do this. And that's pretty much how I'm going to sit it, something like that. Now you'll notice that uh, if that is the case, then this earth wire here getting across to this lug crosses over this one. So I'll be bending wires out of the way. And another thing you can do is actually, instead of using the top of the tags, these, um, where they're crimped onto the, the board, you can actually run them through there and solder them in quite successfully there as well. Uh, so that one I might actually put through there. And then all I'll do is bend the wire up and around the tag um, and then solder it to the tag up there and down here. Uh, so, you know, do what works best for you. Uh, in fact, if I do it that way. That gets everything nice and neatly out of the way and I can actually put a wee bit of heat shrink around all three of those capacitors to sort of hold them in place. So yeah, I think that's what I'm going to do. I'll use a zip tie instead. Doesn't need to be heat shrink. Um, and in fact, it's no point unnecessarily heating. We're not trying to make it look old here. We're just trying to make it look tidy. Like I said, I do draw a distinction between repair and restoration. This is not a restoration. This is a repair. Sure, we'll do some tidying up, but uh, Cut those off flush. Don't leave jaggedy bits sticking out. That's really annoying when that happens. It's even more annoying when you cut yourself on it because it happens. And this is where we will use some heat shrink. Certainly want to put some heat shrink on the positive wires, even, even just short runs. This heat shrink is 600 volt rated. I don't know how good that 600 volt rating is uh, in terms of actual volts, uh, but I've never had any problems with it. Shorting on anything yet. So at that point, that's the caps on the tag strip, and what I'll do is loop them around, cut off the excess, making sure you're aware where the excess is going, not falling into the radio somewhere. And then just crimping it on. ready to cause the next serviceman a headache getting them off but hey the tag strip didn't exist before I came along and try when you're crimping this on to do it in such a way that it's not using the whole hole because we are going to want to fit some wires into this tag strip as well so and leaving a wee bit of space for the other wires to come in while ensuring it's a good mechanical connection
done. So that's nicely soldered. Well, you may not agree. I'm happy with it. And uh, we've got our three three caps all sorted. This is the 20 mic post, this is the earth, this is the first 10, and this is the second 10 here. Right, so it's going to screw in right there, and things will connect up to it just pretty much the way they were. Okay, we're going to find a wee star washer, and then screw this down. So that's sitting in position, it's not near anything, there is a screw here, um, self-tapping screw poking through there, but that's not in my way, it's not in danger of hitting anything. Uh, we've got the wires that we need to refit, this one here, it's from our rectifier, that needs to go to the first 20. Right, now because of the way this radio is wired, that's the only wire going on there, which is handy. Um, depending on your version of Bell Colt, if you're doing one of these, there may be um, more wires going on to each of these. Some of them have quite populated terminals on this electrolytic cap, but fortunately this one uh, is pretty pretty simple. And I'm not sure what the dogs are barking at. Probably nothing. That's kind of what they do. Right, so that's that one done. The uh, second can, which is this yellow one, the only thing that had going to it was this wire here, which as I mentioned is not going to reach. So I'm actually going to replace that. Just be careful we don't melt anything. I do think that that output transformer, I don't think that would have been wired quite this way from the factory. It's a little bit scruffy, even for a Bell Colt. I mean, Bell Colts were their budget model. They were made basically to uh, not so much make the money, but make their name. And uh, it certainly did that. these solder joints just need a wee bit of new solder just to create that heat bridge between the tip and the old joint. I haven't really done want to let go here. I suspect that this wire is crimped on. Alright, we're going to end up... I wonder if that's actually the... Actually, the wire from that electrolytic, uh, from that paper foil cap, which we're going to replace anyway. So that joint is now a mess. I'll have to rework it a little bit. Um, we're using the end of the wire from this, so I'll just pull that out. Now, normally I don't like to disconnect more than one thing at a time, but I kind of want that out of the way. It's going to give me a wee bit of room to poke uh, some new wire in to run between here and here. And I certainly would prefer to not have uninsulated wire running there. So I will probably use a bit of this wire, which I'm pretty sure came from an old ATX computer power supply. run nicely across there and I may because this is quite heavy wire I may actually have to run this around the terminal rather than rather than through the hole so that's what we'll aim to do So 
So I've just put that wire through and wrapped it over the top. I'm sure you can hear just how sad that dog is. How very, very sad. It's such a hard life. isopropyl alcohol and try and give that joint a bit of a clean up before I start messing with it. Now I'm pretty sure now looking at this that it is um, 2.4k so at 2.9 uh, it definitely looks yellow to me not purple uh, so at 2.9k that's too high which means it's starting to go so that I want to replace as well so I'm starting to get a little bit out of control with the number of things I'm changing at once um, and I'm acutely aware of that and it's how accidents or not accidents but mistakes happen and then you end up wondering why things don't work so I'm mentally juggling the fact that I've taken this out, the wires that I've taken off, um, the old electrolytic, where these resistors go, and I'm trying to juggle everything in my head, and I'm about at my uh, cognitive limit for remembering what goes where. Uh, if you haven't done one of these before, I, I strongly recommend you don't even get to this point, uh, unless you've got a bit of a, a brain for these things. So. Draw pictures, make notes, have a, a notebook beside you and, and just jot down the things you're removing and where they went. Uh, I've got a notebook which I use when I'm working on radios and it's actually inside at the moment. I'll, I'll scan a page but I would draw meticulous notes and diagrams of where stuff went because I would quite quickly get lost when I first started doing this as to what went where. Uh, and I found that that was really, really helpful. And in fact, I fully restored a Philco 89 chassis based on some of the notes you just saw. And uh, that those notes saved my life, basically. I mean, it meant that I could completely strip. That was a restoration of that chassis. I stripped it to nothing, uh, every last component out, and uh, restored the chassis, put everything back on, and it worked. Uh, almost first time, actually. Interestingly, the, the thing that failed me was a, a socket which I replaced to try and put the circuitry back to original because somebody put an octal valve in it and it didn't belong so uh, that socket was missing a part and it shorted against the chassis but other than that the, the set worked perfectly first time. Uh, okay so we're going to grab a 2.7k resistor and if you're wondering where I get my parts from uh, they come from all over the place, but the resistors I tend to use the radio spares and they used to, I don't think they do here in New Zealand anymore, but they used to have free shipping so you could pretty much buy anything from, from 50 cents to $100 and it would show up on your doorstep the next day via courier at no charge, which I always thought was mad. Uh, I actually went to order something from them the other day and noticed that there was a $10 charge and I thought that was mad as well, so I didn't buy it. But um, RS Online, or Radio Spares as they used to be known, really handy company for getting stuff. I, I know there's others, there's the likes of Mouser and um, Element 14, and uh, even JCar is a local bricks and mortar store, but has an online presence as well here in New Zealand and Australia. I tend to buy resistors in bulk though, because I use them quite often, it's just nice to have them. Um, so 2K7, these are 2 watt carbon resistors and I buy the carbon ones because uh, they look nicer and there's arguments in restoration circles that the metal film ones can cause issues with RF circuits. I've, I've never really found that to be the case and possibly at higher frequencies it might but um, the carbon film ones also tend to be brown. <laughs> These ones and a lot of the RS ones are pink, which is weird. 
but the brown ones tend to just blend in a little bit better in these old sets. Uh, whereas blue ones definitely look, or the blue metal film colour that they mostly are, they tend to look out of place. Um, <laughs> pink certainly looks out of place. But um, The other thing, and I've mentioned this before, is I try and keep the, all the colour bands reading left to right. Now that obviously depends which way around the chassis is, but if I look in here they're all higgledy-piggledy. Um, but I tend to have the chassis sitting this way when I work on it with the controls away from me when I'm working on one of these, so that's the way I'm probably going to mount it. Now that is a 1 or 2 watt, I think 2 watt resistor. That's also a 2 watt resistor. Now heat is heat and it still has to dissipate. 2 watts is 2 watts regardless of the size of the component. So you want to keep these away from things like your electrolytic capacitors. Um, if heat is what kills these, or one of the things that kills them. So keep hot things away from your capacitors and give them room to breathe. So I'm going to mount this away, probably over about here. This one is also mounted up and away out of the way. Uh, just to add to my cognitive load, I'm babbling. which may cause me some issues in a minute when I'm trying to remember where everything went. The other thing you want to try and do is actually not babble too much and get distracted. One of the things you can do is when you remove something, put clippy leads on it and clip the old component into one end. Um, also be aware of polarity, because some components the polarity matters, some it doesn't. Um, but you have something like a doorbell ring or a phone call or something, you know, that important Instagram message that distracts you while you're uh, in the middle of this. You can end up losing where you were. And I've done it before, and it's a little bit annoying. Uh, it's pretty easy to lose track of what you're doing, where and why. So, oh, we're definitely replacing it now. Um, yeah, little tricks that may or may not help you. I don't claim uh, to have invented any of these tricks. It's just stuff I've picked up over the years. through the hole. Alright, so remember in terms of the schematic, this 1K wire wound effectively runs from the first capacitor to the second, and this one runs from um, the second to the third. So it's going from here across to here. Now I could, because of where it's going, I could actually just mount it on these two tags here as well. Um, that's effectively the same place because it's going to be run via this wire uh, back to here. But I think we'll put it about there. And we'll put some heat shrink on it. Now sometimes I'll heat, uh, I'll shrink heat shrink tubing, and sometimes I'll just leave it as basically just some spaghetti tubing um, doing its job. And I've never really worried either way which way I do it. I'd be interested to hear if anyone has any thoughts on that, technical reasons why maybe you should shrink it. I know that when it's shrunk. Uh, its density increases because it's 
it's drawing in on itself, but um, that may be one reason to consider shrinking it. But I'd be interested to hear if anyone um, has a specific reason why they think it should be shrunk. Is there a chemical change? Is it part of the insulation properties of the tube itself? Does it make it better? Does it make it worse? I don't know. Be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, on the insulation, not the fact that I don't know. Lots of things I don't know. Believe it or not. Right, so this resistor needs to go back onto there as well. Good, I'm starting to reduce the number of things I have to remember. Right, so just use isopropyl alcohol on a, on a cotton bud or a button cod depending how you like to say it, uh, to clean wires like this. You notice this one doesn't have any heat shrink on it. And it'll live dangerous and leave it like that. Uh, if you're under here and you touch it, well, what were you thinking? Were you thinking? Personal responsibility, people. This is not an OSH bubble wrap covered candy land of safety you're working in under here. If you're working on a vintage radio, you're dealing with high voltages. If you get a shock, well, what were you doing? Okay, so before we go any further, actually I'll solder this on. I'll go through and double check that I have soldered everything shortly, but and you do want to check that your solder joint has taken on all the leads, particularly when you're dealing with old leads like this. Um, give it a, a tug and give it a reasonable tug just to make sure that it is soldered on properly and visually inspected up close. If you're like me and your eyeballs are getting on an age. Uh, don't be afraid to put a uh, um, pair of glasses or a, use a magnifying lens of some sort. Uh, so we want to replace this cap. It's 0 0.005, so it's a 5 nanofarad. Alright, so what I do have is some of these green caps. Um, I don't know what values they are, and the values are really hard to read. There we go, 4.8 nanofarads, that'll do me near enough for a government job. And the only issue we're going to have now is getting this capacitor from here right up to here because those legs won't reach. So I'm going to leave this leg on and I'll J-hook off there and run it to here. Now, is this an ideal way to do it? Probably not. But everything in here was point to point from the factory, admittedly with heavier duty leads. And I'm going to put a wee bit of heat on here, so I've got this uh, device which will just draw some heat out of that leg and stop it going up into the capacitor. Don't ask me where you buy those. I'm sure they're available. Um, I don't remember where I got mine or how long I've had it. But it is best not to heat these up. Very thin plastic film in them. They don't like it. So, unless you're sitting at home screaming at me you forgot that wire. I did actually. I haven't put the earth wire on. So we'll do that. Like I said, I'm not going to rely on the screw into the chassis alone. Let's J 
just not a suitable um, bonding point. Now this wire, just as an aside, um, because I do, uh, and if you're watching the Pacific 107 series that I started and haven't, haven't done any more work on, uh, one of the things I was doing, and I'll do a video on this, was making some um, sort of replacement look-alike original radio cork capacitors, and this was my first attempt, and it's not that great. It's got a 3D printed body inside with a printed label and then dropped in. Well, actually, I just dripped candle wax all over it and then used the heat gun to blow it off. Um, but it's got just a standard um, orange drop cap in it uh, in that printed body. And then I just used some wire that I had. I actually stripped wire out of... Um, some solid core wire that I had to do this one and I've been looking for some tinned copper wire so that I didn't have to waste my good insulated stuff and again RS so catalog number 355-079 and it's 22 gauge or it's about 0.7 mil I think I don't know what that is in that other weird measurement unit that some people use but uh, in millimeters it's 0.7 or thereabouts um, so it's not super cheap but it's actually a really handy roll of stuff and I think I'll probably uh, it's one of the things I use quite a bit for all kinds of stuff now so I think I'll probably buy another roll of it at some point just in case they ever stop having it available Yeah, when I bought that not so long ago, shipping was free. So I need to investigate that, if that's just a shipping fee they have started doing. I know shipping started to become a nightmare for some companies. Um, and it always did amaze me that RS didn't charge shipping. And it meant that I never bothered carrying stock of certain things because I knew that I could virtually overnight uh, have it, even if it was somewhere else in the world it would take a couple of days and I would have it which uh, was beautifully convenient but I always wondered how the business model worked that they would treat me like a first-class citizen even though I was buying virtually nothing now, this is a fine example of something I should have done first <laughs> because it's a bugger of a thing to get to now. Alright, so I've got that wire routed pretty neatly so it's not going to touch anything else. It's right down against the chassis. I'm going to try and get in there and put some solder on that tag. Now, my wee soldering iron, I'm going to turn it up full bore which is about 480 degrees but it's only a small tip and so it does struggle with these tags on these electrolytic capacitors at times because they are connected to the chassis and aluminium chassis does act like a pretty decent heat sink but we got that one okay So that's wrapped right around that lug um, and soldered on with everything else. Soldered onto the earth. That tag soldered, the other tags are soldered. I've done that, replace that capacitor. I've got the two resistors on. That resistor's back on, so this is where notes would have helped. Uh, I'd have normally done this probably in about a third of the time, but because I'm waffling while I'm doing it, <clears throat> I just <laughs> need to refresh my brain. Yeah, 
should have made notes, eh? Um, so as far as I can see, I'm all done there. And I could go through and do the rest of the recapping, but what I want to do first is just make sure that I've got everything correct. So what we're going to do is go back on the dim bulb tester and I'll just do that off cam. But just be aware that that's what we're doing. We're still using dim bulb to ensure that uh, if there is a problem with what I just did, uh, I should be aware of it. So we'll put the output valve back in. We've definitely got output there, I can hear scratching from the second cap into 330 and from the final cap 325. dogs it should be fairly obvious that we've got no signal uh, which means we've got a problem which means I've probably screwed something up so at this point we're going to do a little bit of troubleshooting work out where I went wrong so rectifiers there So we didn't touch anything here. We've got a wire which runs to our first cap. First cap to ground. And at the same time from that first cap to here, we've got a 1K resistor. And that 1K resistor is connected via this wire to the second cap. Um, so this is the point between the two uh, uh, between the two resistors and then this resistor runs across to the final cap um, you're screaming at the screen at the moment I apologize I'm just struggling to see where the problem is it looks for all the world like it should work. So let's just make sure we don't have, because this is a bit of a dirty chassis. Alright, well, <laughs> that's got me beat. I'm glad I didn't go any further because I'd have been really confused. That thing I was saying about cognitive load. What have I forgotten? What are you all screaming at me at the moment? It's going to be something silly. It's going to be something obvious. Definitely got HT, it's a bit high, higher than I would expect. Um, 
that's definitely a 2K7 resistor, that's a 1K. A uh, speaker is outputs connected and we're getting crackling so and buzz so I know that that side of it is okay. Um, Uh, funny. Remember this wire I said was too short and would have to be replaced? Why did nobody say, hey, don't forget to connect that wire up? So visual inspection is really important. Apologies for the slight camera angle change there. <laughs> if I hadn't screwed this up, I would have actually been finished before the battery in the camera died. But uh, that was not to be. So I've done this end, I've heat shrunk this, it's wrapped around here, so I'm just going to solder it on here. So yeah, it should have been a, a well, it was a warning valve for me that the voltage was so high because normally the output valve would be sucking that voltage down a bit and regulating it and that wasn't the case so I was getting quite a high voltage reading. What I fully expect now that we've done the job properly is that we'll, uh, we should expect to see you know 280, 290 volts here, um, sort of 280 and then maybe 250 here. That's ballpark what I would expect to see so I'm taking that away. All right so let's power up and we'll just check right start to climb that's much better Into Alright, okay, so we've got 235 there, 200 there, and 170. Now that's through the dim bulb, that's not full voltage. So let's go full voltage, 280, that's good. 240, that's good. 190, right. So actually the voltages are now maybe just slightly a bit lower than I would have expected, but I'm okay with that. I don't mind lower voltages. It means less stress on things. Actually having a lower voltage is no problem. Um, it could be being dragged down a bit by uh, these caps. So once we get those replaced, uh, we'll have a better idea of how things stand. up so you guys can see what's happening. Not that anything particular is happening but um, there's just dust everywhere. Picking bits of dust off the whole time. An investigation's ramping up into Donald Trump's lawyer Rudy Giuliani and his attempts to dig up dirt on the Bidens in Ukraine. I gotta love America. It has been deleted and electronic. And this has been a really 
highly popular investment over the last five years. There's more spend has shifted. Apologise for that. Um, obviously, a wee problem with the volume control. We'll uh, throw some contact cleaner into that. But at this stage, electrically, we done. 